So I'm Nathan Goodman. I'm the Lysander Spooner Research Scholar in Abolitionist Studies at the Center for a Stateless Society. The Center for a Stateless Society is a left-wing market anarchist think tank and media center. So I'm a left-wing market anarchist or an individualist anarchist who emphasizes prison abolition and why we should get rid of the carceral state. So the United States has the largest prison population in the world. Uh, most of the people locked up in these prisons are people of color who have been historically marginalized and are currently marginalized largely by the prison system in this country. Uh, the prison system tends to manifest as systematic violence. It's locking human beings in cages where they are vulnerable to violence by both guards and fellow prisoners. The prison system is using guns to keep people confined in environments where they cannot flourish. It is locking them in cages to be raped. It is holding them in environments where they might be locked in solitary confinement, cut off from all human contact, and subjected to both psychological and physical torture. It is the great crime of our times. So the big question that a lot of people have with prison abolition is what about the dangerous people? How are we going to deal with criminals, especially violent criminals or criminals even who violate property rights, who steal people's stuff? And that's an important question. But what we have to remember is that as legal scholar and founder of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, Dean Spade puts it, the prison is the serial killer. The prison is the serial rapist. These environments are environments in which people are vulnerable to sexual assault by both guards and fellow inmates. They're environments that shorten the lifespan of inmates and sometimes create situations where guards murder prisoners, sometimes torturing them to death. So I don't think crime can be the response to crime. So what can be the response to crime? What is a just response to injustice? What is a just response to interpersonal violence? And the first answer is it's open-ended. Situations differ, and uh, local conditions differ, and the needs of individual victims will differ. But there are a lot of different things we can do to deal with these problems. One thing we can do is restitution. If I were to steal your shirt or burn down your house, I owe you restitution for the property that I took from you. And I can do the best I can to make you whole, and it is legitimate to use force to make me make you whole if I've done that. In other cases, what we can do is we can facilitate community responses to interpersonal violence. And I was just on a panel with a wonderful person named Rebecca Crane, who does a lot of work developing apps to resolve issues of interpersonal violence. These apps have names like the Predator Alert Tool, which has uh, applications for a variety of social networking sites that allow people to share information about abusers, to connect with survivors of abuse from the same abuser. So on Facebook, for example, you can put out a uh, report on the app and it will connect you with other people who have suffered similar forms of victimization. And then you can work out what to do. So innovation allows us to develop unique social solutions to unique social problems. It's important to remember that the state's criminal justice system is not currently resolving issues of sexual violence, which is in my view, one of the most severe forms of violence that can take place. The state's criminal justice system is both perpetuating sexual violence and failing survivors of sexual violence because most survivors don't report to the police because they know, unfortunately, that they will be dismissed, that they will be questioned, that they will have to relive their trauma. They know that rape kits are, one, having a massive backlog in many cities where they go untested, and that those rape kits are very invasive processes to take, that they get 
good physical evidence that's incredibly important for bringing the perpetrator to justice or to what the state system calls justice, but that it's a very invasive and traumatizing process for survivors. So it's very costly to use the state's criminal justice system to resolve this problem, and a lot of solutions are developing, ranging from restitution to restorative justice to the use of technology to allow uh, survivors to both warn others about perpetrators and to connect with others who have had similar experiences and resolve uh, the issues and get care for one another and build a community-based response. Another app that's being developed by Rebecca Crane and other hacktivists who are working on this is an app called Buoy or Better Angels, which allows people to create a crisis response team among their friends and among people they know and to uh, press a button when they're in a crisis that will send some specifics about the crisis and send their location to their crisis response team um, as well as an interactive map and a chat so that they can communicate and that they can coordinate a response in the moment to deal with crises and issues of interpersonal violence. A similar app that functions this way um, is an app called Circle of Six that allows you to create a circle of six people to do the same sort of thing. And so these things are being developed on the ground, not by anarchists necessarily, although buoy and uh, the Predator Alert tool are developed by anarchists, but I don't believe that anarchists developed the Circle of Six app, but rather by people who care for survivors because they know that the state system is not serving their needs. They know that the current system of criminal justice does not adequately resolve issues of interpersonal violence and that we need to do better and that with innovation and community-based solutions and voluntary social cooperation, we can do better. The state doesn't just fail to address violent crime. The state often creates conditions for violent crime. And I think that's really important to emphasize. So let me give you a few examples. When the government prohibits drugs, that means that drug transactions happen in a black market. And what happens in a black market? Well, let's contrast it with a legal market. If there is a legal above ground market in any sort of good, if I get ripped off by a distributor, I have the opportunity to write a negative review. I have an opportunity to tell my friends, I have an opportunity to switch suppliers. I have an opportunity to encourage other people to switch suppliers. So that'll cut into their profits. I also might have an opportunity to seek restitution through the courts or through some other justice system for the wrong that was done to me. I can't do that in a black market. In a black market, it has to be kept underground. It has to be kept on the down low. And when you have to keep transactions on the down low, you cannot use reputation mechanisms and you cannot use restitution mechanisms. So you resolve disputes through violence. Violence is created by drug prohibition. Violence is created by the prohibition on sex work because it deters people from seeking alternative, seeking above ground means to resolve disputes. If I've prohibited sex work, if a sex worker knows that if she reports that she's been raped by a John, she can be sent to prison, she won't do it. Moreover, even if she knows that she won't be sent to prison, as under the Nordic model, um, but that her business will be destroyed and that she'll be diverted into all sorts of programs that are meant to care for or rehabilitate her, she still likely won't do it because that will take away her livelihood. That will constrain and control her choices. So the options that crime victims have are grotesquely constrained by prohibition. The possibilities that create peaceful social cooperation in markets, even markets that someone might consider seedy or might not morally approve of, have been cut off, and that has created environments of organized criminal violence. The same thing happens due to immigration restrictions. Immigration restrictions define human beings as illegal. They say that you cannot interact with the state because you don't have the correct documents and that you must therefore keep your interactions underground. This makes people vulnerable. If an undocumented worker is assaulted by her boss while she's working in the fields, as unfortunately many are, she's not going to go to the police. Many rape victims already don't go to the police, but an undocumented worker who fears that she will be deported afterwards, after reporting, will not report. This creates a power imbalance. This defines human beings as illegal, as less than human, and it subjects them to violence not just by border patrol agents, not just by the ICE agents and DHS agents that guard detention centers, but by their bosses, by any criminal. Immigration restrictions make human beings vulnerable to crime, 
And they also make people vulnerable to premature death by closing them off from peaceful and sustainable methods of travel towards much more costly movement facilitated by coyotes or facilitated along these black market border routes or on rickety ships through the Mediterranean Sea. Human beings are subjected to premature death by the violence of the state. These policies do not stop crime. They create a vile opportunity for it and allow it to fester. So what can we do to end mass incarceration? What can we do to end the carceral state? What can we do to end the policies that dehumanize people, drive markets underground, and create crime rather than stopping it? And I think there are a lot of things we can do, and they don't involve political reform. They involve direct action. You can support prisoners. You can write letters to them. You can donate to them. You can donate to their legal defense and help them stay out of the criminal justice system, get free from the criminal justice system, or just not have so terrible and dehumanizing lives where they're isolated within the criminal justice system. Some organizations that do this sort of prisoner support and prisoner letter writing include Black and Pink, which focuses on supporting LGBT prisoners, and uh, the Anarchist Black Cross, which focuses on providing support to prisoners they consider political prisoners or prisoners of war, not prisoners of formal war between states, but prisoners of the social war that the state and other elite interests are waging on marginalized people. Another thing that you can do is keep people out of prison by making sure that if you're ever on a jury, you vote not guilty, regardless of what you think the evidence says about whether someone violated an unjust law or a state edict. This is a practice called jury nullification. And even if you're never on a jury, you can promote jury nullification by passing out literature that alerts people that this is an option, that it's a legal option, and that it has a long tradition in Anglo-American common law. Jury nullification is a long-standing legal right. Jurors cannot be punished for their verdicts, and this has been established for centuries. The Fully Informed Jury Association, whose website is fija.org or fija.org, has lots of information and literature that you can distribute peacefully outside courthouses so as to alert people, both potential jurors and just passers-by, as to this fundamental right that can help you keep people out of the horrifying, violent clutches of prison. Another thing that you can do is build alternatives to the police. Build communities that can deal with interpersonal violence without turning to the state's monopoly on force, law, security, and justice. Break down their monopoly. The type of technological development that involves building apps to give sexual assault survivors options, to give people options to respond in a crisis as it's happening, these are tools that we can continue to develop so that people don't feel that they need to rely on the police, don't feel that they need to rely on the state, don't feel that the only way to protect themselves is to lock a human being in a cage. We can illustrate that there are alternatives. We can prove that another world is possible by acting now to make it real. Um, one last thing I'll probably mention is that uh, we have to be wary of criminal justice reform. Because criminal justice reform, unfortunately, can often seem like the humane way to roll back the prison state, but it can often just make the Leviathan, the monstrosity, the state violence stronger. So to give a few examples, prisons themselves emerged as a reform. Prisons were developed to be more humane than corporal punishment and capital punishment. It was thought that we could reform prisoners by locking them up, that we could actually make their lives better. And the, one of the worst practices that's used in prisons was developed for this express purpose. Solitary confinement was proposed by Quaker social reformers as a tool to help prisoners be able to have silent reflection I'm going to sit alone in a room and I'm going to think about myself and what I've done and how I can be better and how I can commune with Christ. And that's going to be a great thing that's going to make me a better human being who can reintegrate in society. But we know now through a lot of psychological research that that's not what happens. And we don't just know this as libertarians. 
The establishment knows this. Juan Mendez, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, knows this. Psychologists know it and report on it in their literature. And even our enemies, even people who have never met a government intervention or a war they didn't like, like John McCain, recognize that solitary confinement is soul-crushing torture. John McCain knows it because he lived it. So if one of the worst things that prisons do to people resulted from a reform, resulted from the best of intentions, we need to watch for how our best intentions could make the world a whole lot worse and could usher in a better carceral state. And that's why we need to always keep our eyes on the prize. We should be envisioning possibilities for prison abolition and for direct action outside the state, rather than for reforms that once filtered through the political process will be distorted by concentrated interest groups like prison guards and police unions, like prison profiteers and companies that profit off incarceration, and like rationally ignorant voters who just want the state to protect them. Let's build alternatives and route around the state so that the incentives are there for our solutions to interpersonal violence to be responsive to the individual unique needs of local communities rather than the political demands of interest groups. Reform has many pitfalls, and while abolition may seem more dangerous, I would argue that prison abolition is the practical plan to reduce crime and build a society with true justice.